uh, I recommend you to ask the questions uh, before uh, the uh, be, uh, before the presentation and uh, to avoid any uh, delay uh, effect. So uh, let me introduce. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, my name is Yoko Yamanishi from Kyushu University. I'm the chair of this session. So let me introduce the first uh, keynote speaker. Uh, the title of the first keynote speaker is the uh, biohybrid micro and nanostructuring, and the, uh, the uh, presenter is Professor uh, Walter van der Wingerd. And the, uh, uh, he uh, is from the uh, KTH Royal Institute of Technology. Uh, his background in, uh, uh, in short is uh, Professor uh, Bauter uh, is the professor in micro and nanosystem with a research focusing on the microfluidic on a, and Labona chip systems and micro nanostructure, soft matter, biosynthesis and biomedical micro devices. And Professor Bauter received uh, MSc and a PhD in uh, KTH and uh, fruit professor in uh, 2010. And uh, he is the uh, technical program chair of the IEEE Transducers 2025, if there is, and the uh, uh, social event chair of the Microtest 2020 online, and also the uh, the TCP uh, conference, I'm sorry, a uh, conference chair of the IEEE MEMS conference in uh, 2015. He is uh, editorial and also after 2016 executive board member of the journal of MEMS and uh, he had uh, published more than 160 internal peer review journals and uh, he his publications uh, has more than 4,000 citations. So please start uh, uh, your presentation, uh, Professor Bauta, please. Thank you very much. Um, I first want to thank uh, Professor Yamanishi uh, for inviting me and of course also Professor Tanaka for organizing this uh, event. I will share my screen now. So, uh, can you confirm that you see my screen in full view, Yoko? Do you see my screen at the moment? Can you hear me? It's perfect. Okay, thank you. So I will organize my talk in nine haikus. Haiku number one, biohybrid micro nanostructures emerging from nine haiku poems. I will talk about micro and nanostructures in medicine and life sciences for the sampling, for detection, for treatment and for constructing new novel things. <clears throat> Haiku number two, minimal invasive cell sampling. With low invasion, harvesting cells deep within, the body reveals. The first part of my talk will be about, will be about uh, minimal invasive cell sampling. So today, if you are, if the doctor wants to diagnose your cells, uh, what they do is they remove tissue and they look either at the tissue, that's histopathology or at the cells in cytology, or they send it for an RNA sequencing to learn more about you. And doing this minimally invasive is of course, increases patient safety and increases quality of life. We explore two working channels to be able to take out cells from the body, from deep inside the body in locations that are hard to reach. The first route is the gastrointestinal route where we use endoscopy. The second route is the vascular route. That means to the blood veins where we go into the groin and be able to reach the body to the uh, vasculature. <clears throat> My first technology I talk about is a loop shaped brush for sampling cells inside the cyst, inside a pancreas. So since the past 10, 20 years, there is a huge development in terms of ultrasound endoscopy. So now we are able to put an endoscope deep into the stomach, even into the intestine, and use an ultrasound transducer to see what happens inside the body. And since we are able to do that, 
we are now seeing that in the pancreas of patients, we often see a cyst. And these cysts, before we didn't know they were there, but now we see there are actually, in many patients, they have cysts. Most of the time, the cysts are benign, but sometimes they are malign. And if they are malign, we want to know that because they can be precursor for pancreatic cancer. And to be able to test that, we need to be able to remove cells from inside the cyst, take them out of the body, and then analyze them. <clears throat> this is this you do using a fine needle, and you see that here. So you have a fine needle that sucks out. You can stick it from the stomach to the stomach wall into the cyst and suck out liquid. The problem is that in 20% of cases, 20% <coughs> of cases you find no cells, and the reason is that the most of the cells are actually on the outer boundary of the cyst. So we developed a cell brush to brush off the cells from the cyst. And so it works like this. You, you insert your needle in the cyst and through the needle, this needle is 400, has 400 micrometer in a diameter. Through the needle, you put in a loop, a wire, and this loop expands in the brush, in the cyst, and then you rotate it around and you abrade cells, and then you can suck them out, you aspirate them. This is how it looks like. So here you see the head of the endoscope with a transducer, and this is the fine needle. And this is the loop that we can operate inside. So this loop is an, a thin wire, only 50 micrometer thin, and it's made in nitinol. And it's made in the form of a loop, and it's knotted to a guide wire. Uh, and so you can operate it from inside the cyst. Here you can see how we test this in vivo. Uh, using a cow ovary, we insert the needle. If we only aspirate without brushing, we see we find only very few cells. If we insert our brush and rotate and we aspirate, we find a lot of cells. So this is work in progress. You see these are images from last week where we did for the first time in vivo testing on a pork model. And if you want to know more, this is a uh, publication, the first publication on this technology. And you see this is together with the Karolinska University Hospital and with the Karolinska Institute we work. The second technology was to enter the body via the vasculature. There is a technology that is called uh, extraducer catheter. And an extraducer catheter is a very long tube, two meter long tube, but very small only 190 micrometer in outer diameter. And so what we can do is to insert this tube via the groin. And because the tube is so small, it's very flexible. So as a matter of fact, you can move the tube all the way, for example, inside the head. And if you want, even inside the eye, through the blood veins. So it's so flexible. And once you do that, you can actually exit the vasculature. And that's what you see here. You, uh, when you're in the place, you exit with your tube. This is the night tube. And now you're inside the organ. And now you have a channel from inside the organ to outside the body. This channel has an inner diameter of only 147 micrometers. It's very small. And you can actually see that image here where you see the needle poking out, out of the blood vessel. So now we have a working channel. And what our group does is to develop tools, silicon tools that we can operate through this channel. The first tool that we developed was a silicon uh, microbiopsy tool that is made using deep reactive ion etching. And here you see a cartoon of it. And here you see how it looks in the real life. So this is a silicon tool, a gripper, sorry, a gripper that is fixated to the nitinol wire and that can be inserted all the way to the tube inside the tissue to grip uh, cells. Here you can see a human hair as size comparison. This is how it works. So you have your microbiopsy tool, you put it inside your extraducer and you have hold it there. Then you insert the entire, entire uh, uh, system into the tissue. You push out the gripper, the gripper expands, grabs. So when you pull back, you can see this small dowels here on the side, these two dots, they will force the extraducer to collapse again when it moves back. And in that way, grip tissue and you have the tissue in place and now you can remove the extraducer and look at the cells. And here's the images how this looks like. So the gripper coming out and going in. I also have a video showing this. And this is done in a gelatin model where we simply film. So you can see the needle that is inserted here has an inner diameter of only 150 micrometer. Here we come out with the gripper 
we grip gelatin. When it goes in, it forces to close up, and now we grab gelatin. Now we can move the entire structure outside the gelatin, which is the body, so outside the body. And then we can look, we can push out again, and we can see we have captured our sample, in this case, gelatin inside the gripper. Here you can see images of uh, in vivo harvesting of cells inside the rat. These are samples from the brain and from the kidney, and we've also tested this on the liver. And this is bright field, and here you see the fluorescent stain, and we can estimate that we have between 500 to 1,000 cells during one single sampling event. This was uh, shown for the first time in the MEMS 2020 conference. I used this uh, image to show that this is worked together with the group of Stefan Holmin, who is a uh, specialist, again, in the Karolinska uh, Institute. And he has developed the extraducer, and we developed the micro MEMS tools for his extraducer. Next part of my talk, haiku number three. It is about urinary tract infection diagnosis. Night in pain in pee. Grow colored dots row on row, promise cure at dawn. What we are doing here is developing digital biosensors, and I will first introduce you to digital bioassays. Imagine we have a sample, uh, which is yellow, and I want to measure two particles, can be two molecules or two cells, it doesn't matter, but a low abundant amount of sample. Uh, what we can do is we can digitize a sample, for example, cut it in 100 pieces, and then you see we have 100 wells, of which 98 are empty, and two contain one particle. You see, in the beginning, we have a concentration of two particles per 100 microliter. But after we do the digitization, in the positive wells, we have one particle per one microliter. So we have a 50 times up concentration in this well. Yeah. So this allows now to, we, if we can do this, if we can sense, we need less sensitive sensors here to detect those. And we can simply count the amount of positive wells. And so we have a digital counting a digital quantitation. This is a digital bioassay. How that works for urinary tract infection, I will show in the next movie. So we made these dipsticks. They are basically little paddles with 280 little holes. And in every hole, we have a little bit of uh, agar gel. And in the agar gel, we have a chromogenic medium. So if we dip this in urine, uh, we, I'm trying to find my cursor, so here. So if we dip this in urine, we trap bacteria in the wells. And the wells are so small that they either trap zero bacteria or one bacteria. If they trap a single bacteria, the bacteria starts growing in a very small wall, so the well, so this goes very fast, and the, the well changes color. In this case, for example, from white to, uh, to a purple. And then after incubation, we simply count how many dots are purple and how many are white, and we know uh, the concentration. Here you can see, for example, for low concentration, we have maybe only one bacteria for 1,000 per ml, 10,000, and you see at when we have 100,000 or more, all the wells contain bacteria. We can, of course, make a sensor response curve of that by looking at different concentrations, how many positive wells do we have? And you can see that we have a sensor with 
a quantitation range of about two magnitudes orders, and they are uh, covering the clinically relevant range for urinary tract infections. We then went to the hospital and tested our, uh, uh, our dipstick uh, with real clinical samples. And we could show here, this is the gold standard on the x-axis. Sorry, I want to find here. On the x-axis is the gold standard measured. And this is with the digital dipstick. And we hope, of course, to find a perfect match. And we see that 25 out of 28 samples were positive and three we had false negatives. So we have a, at the moment in our lab testing already in 90, 89% sensitivity. <laughs> this was worked together with the University Hospital of Antwerp, the group of uh, Professor Hermann Holsens. Next part of my talk is about detection of DNA. And also the next haiku, haiku number four, DNA templated gold nanowires. Unknown DNA wires current in treasure measure in femto. What we want to do here is to measure DNA strands in a very low abundance in a sample. So what you typically would do is you do a amplification and then to you have a symbol. So everybody nowadays knows what is PCR because we are in the COVID <laughs> pandemic. So you take your DNA, you amplify it. It typically takes one or two hours and then you can measure in high abundance. We want to do it faster. We want to directly measure the DNA. What we want to do is we want to grab a strand of DNA and measure electrically whether it's there or not. This poses two challenges. Challenge one, the DNA strands are typically 50 nanometer long. So how can I grab a object that is 50 nanometer? Challenge one. Challenge number two, if I succeed to grab 50 nanometer strand, I cannot measure it because it is not conductive. So I need to solve that also. The way we do this is starting from a porous membrane. Here you see top view. It's a membrane of 10 micrometer uh, thickness and contains hole, holes that are typically one to two micrometer in size. We coat the membrane with gold on the top and the bottom surface. And we put also uh, uh, tile oligoprobes. So these are, um, these are specific for the DNA I want to measure. Now I add my sample and if I sample, it will bind to the probe. And it is, the probe is designed so that the sample strands bind on both sides. So they form a circular, uh, circular DNA loop. And then you hybridize that. And then you do an amplification, a short amplification. This is a rolling circle amplification. And what happens is that this circle gets amplified, 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 amplified. And in a very short time, I turn a 50 nanometer uh, wire into a 50 micrometer wire, thousand times longer. Now I flow using water flow, I flow this, I suck the liquid to the nano, to the micropore. And now I have actually solved the first problem. I have a now a long DNA strand that couples from one side of the electrode to the other side of the electrode. Huh? I can visualize that by coating them with fluora force. And here I see, for example, confocal images of these wires through. This is the top view, and this is the true view of the membrane. And you can see how wires are going through this one micrometer pores. Still, I need to solve my second problem, that of conductivity. Instead of using fluora force, I can also coat gold nanoparticles that are specific, which I can do. And then I can do gold enhancement. And then basically what I create is a gold nano wire from the top surface to the bottom. And that one I can measure electrically. This is how it looks like in the SEM. You can see here, here was one DNA strand and here was another one and a third one. You cannot see the DNA strand because they are now coated with the gold. And you can see coating with gold creates a gold nanowire of size typically 300 nanometer thick that going through this one micrometer diameter pores. And you can actually measure that. Here is a cartoon showing how that is done. Then we went on to build a sensor around this. So now we make six different wells and here another six and another six. And now we can add sample to that uh, and then do the same procedure. And now we can start counting how many in how many of the wells do we actually create a contact, yes or no. So we have a positive control, a negative control, and we have our sample. And then we can see how sensitive it is. And we can see if we have sample with a concentration as low as 790 zeptomolar, so that's very little. So we have nanomolar, picomolar, femtomolar, atomolar, zeptomolar. So extremely low concentration. We can still pick this up. 
This means that in our sample of 50 microliter, we had roughly uh, 20 uh, strands of DNA only, and we can pick those up. These are the publications related to this. This is work together with uh, the group of Mats Nilsson in the uh, University of Stockholm. Uh, I will now uh, talk about a do a sidestep and talk about a polymer that we have developed because I, in the rest of my talk I will refer to this polymer. The polymer is called of stoichiometric thioline and this is haiku number five. Mixed out of balance, thiols and enes provide chips, reactive surface. Thioline uh, chemistry is very old, it's very well known. Basically what you do is you take a thiol group, which means a, a polymer group with uh, the SH, sulfur and hydrogen groups. And we have an in group, so which means you have a double carbon bond between the two uh, carbon uh, atoms. And you take monomers of enes and of thiols and you mix them and you give them a little bit of energy and they will form, they will cross link into a polymer. The trick that we have is that we do it wrong. We take too much thiol and too little in. And so what happens if you mix them, you will see that because we have too little in and too much tile, all the enes will bind, but not all the tile. So we will have all the enes will be eaten away, but we will have three tile groups available, reactive tile groups. So we create a solid, but with a lot of reactive groups, tile groups active at the surface. Now this gives a lot of interesting properties. It gives you perfect control over your surface chemistry because you have reactive groups that you can use to, uh, to tune your surface uh, for binding molecules or for hydrophobic hydrophilic treatment. To our uh, surprise, this is also a great polymer for photostructuring. So you can use it as SU8. You can do direct photolithography in it. You can also use it for molding or for um, uh, uh, or machining. So it also works like PDMS. You can tune the mechanical properties between very floppy and very stiff, and you can do unassisted true mass bonding because you have reactive groups. So the material bond when you bring it in contact without the use of glue. Extremely interesting in the MEMS uh, applications, I think. This is uh, commercialized by some of my students, uh, and you can find a company, Mercine Labs, and where you to buy this polymer. So as I said, you can photostructure it. You can do that thick layers or thin layers, as thin as 70 nanometers possible, as thick as centimeters possible. Um, you can make beautiful molding structures. So within, you can use this for reaction injection molding with a turnaround time of around 30 seconds. And here you see beautiful structures, uh, beautiful structures that are demolded and bonded and with, uh, and with uh, tube connectors. You can also uh, structure not only on the micro scale. So this is a one centimeter structure, but we can zoom in and zoom in and zoom further in. And so you can see in this structure, we have on the big structure, we also have nanostructures down to sizes of 100, 200 nanometer in size. So you can combine micro, uh, micro structures, microstructure and nanostructure in a single molding step. This is unique. Here you see more and uh, also where we have published this. You can see here, for example, molded na polymer nanopillars, very dense pillars. They are spaced only 300 nanometer apart and they're only 100 nanometer in size and a micrometer high. Here you see deep holes going 70 nanometer holes going several, uh, more than one micrometer deep in arrays. So this is all possible. Here you can see also that you can grow cells on that. And for example, that is interesting, you can see how cells interact with this uh, structure. You can also, the OSTE, you can tune it for E-beam structuring, which we have shown here. Um, and the interesting thing is now that you can do an E-beam structuring and immediately, the, so we have now an E-beam structured polymer that has reactive surface and you can immediately bind protein to that. So you can do an immediate protein functionalization of your structure if you want to do that. We published this in ACS Nano two years ago. Here you can see these are lines that are only 250 nanometer wide. They are E-beam structured and then coated with a fluorophore. So they are visible in a, uh, to a fluorescent microscope. And here you see features as small as 20 nanometer ribbons that we create using E-beam lithography of this material. You can tune the stiffness between very stiff and between very soft. And here you can see you can use this, for example, for quake valving, microdix. Well, you can, of course, also uh, surface energy pattern the material. So you can graft hydrophilic groups or hydrophobic groups 
You do that with photographing, so it's lithography process. It's a covalent change. So you can make these chips, make them, for example, hydrophilic, where the liquid goes, hydrophobic, there's no liquid flowing. And this material you can put in boiling water for 24 hours and take it out, and you will still have the same hydrophilic groups and hydrophobic groups, which is, of course, very good. It's also optically clear, high refractive index. We tested it for optical purposes as optical waveguides. You can grow cells on it. It's a very versatile material. We're using this now, this material, for uh, purposes such as uh, in the next, I'm going to talk uh, uh, one format we use it for. It's called synthetic paper. And we use the synthetic paper to create lateral flow diagnostic tests. This is haiku number six. Flowing through paper. The blood falls into pieces, revealing secrets. Well, this synthetic paper, if you take a small beam, a small pillar of this material, so for example, here you see pillars that are 50 nanometer in diameter, and you make many, many, many pillars, and you make sure that every pillar is connected to another pillar, then you create a mesh uh, slanted pillar scaffold, a single material that is highly porous, but that also forms one single material and it's like paper but it's plastic so we call it synthetic microfluidic paper this paper we make it's very easy to make in a single step a single lithography so what we do is we make a mask with holes and then we shine light through the holes but normally you shine light from top to bottom but not we do it here we do we shine the light from four different directions left right front and back at the same time and so in every hole starts growing one pillar in four different directions. And the pillar growing from this hole in this direction will come together with the pillar of this hole and they will bond together. And they will do that in a 3D matrix. So in a single lithography step and a single development step, within a minute to five minutes, we create sheets of, of this uh, material. Now we want to use this for lateral flow assays. So for doing testing, such as for example, we see now coming in, a, in the COVID, you see this test coming. Why do we want to use this paper? Because it has a repeatable surface chemistry. Remember, it has a tile groups that we can functionalize at will and very controllable. It has a repeatable geometry. We know very well how it looks like, perfectly controlled. It has a high surface area and it's optically transparent. So the first thing we did is was looking at, can we uh, use this, for example, to uh, capillary flow blood? And this is indeed, it's possible. And this is what you see happening here. 10 times speed, you see how the blood flows to the material and you can see you can do capillary pumping and hopefully do a bioassay. We see if we compare to, for example, nitrocellulose paper, we have a standard deviation in pumping, a volume control that's much, much better, four times better, because it's a perfectly controlled structure. So the filling is very, very well controlled. Now, in most applications, you're actually not interested in the blood, but you're interested in the blood plasma. Uh, and so what we want to do is we want to start from the blood and we want to retain all the cells. So all the blood cells we want to keep and only the plasma to flow through. Now, this is problematic because the synthetic paper has pores of size 50 micrometer and the blood cells, they have a size typically eight to 10 micrometer. They are much smaller, so they can flow freely. So this is a problem. Now I had a very clever student <coughs> who solved this problem. <coughs> what he did is he found an antibody, an agglutinating antibody. And this antibody, that's a protein. If you add it to blood, it will make sure that two red blood cells stick together. It's like a glue for blood cells. So we add this to blood, the blood will start clotting. And now if you clot blood, clot blood, you form clots of blood, they cannot flow to the paper. So what he did was that he prepared a synthetic paper. And here you see top view of that. So the blue is a synthetic paper. And he has, in this case, he has put no uh, anti, uh, antibody, and in this case, he did put agglutinating antibody. So if you do not put anti, uh, antibody, of course, the blood just flows everywhere. But if you put the agglutinating antibody, if you put a droplet, the blood starts clotting, but very soon, the blood cells cannot flow and they form a barrier for other, flow, uh, for other blood cells, but the plasma can still flow freely through. So you see, you create all the red blood cells stay in the middle and the plasma flows to the outside. Now he put that in a usable format where he has a loading pad here, this uh, diamond, he adds the blood, and then you see you get clotting, and the blood remains here, the blood cells, but the plasma, you can see the front starts flowing through the paper. And so what we get, we fill this entire channel here, 
three centimeter long channel of synthetic paper filled with pure plasma. Now, why is this interesting? Uh, uh, because compare, so today it's also possible to, to filter blood, but you use a filter on top of, of another filter. And so the blood has to go to filter and this filter has to have very small holes. And when it has very small holes to hold the cells, it also has a large area and it, it binds the protein from the blood. So you get your plasma through, but a lot of the protein from the plasma remains inside the filter. In our case, we have a very big filter, very big hole, so we have much less surface area. So we have much less uh, uh, protein that is bonded. So if you compare, we have 9% uh, more protein flowing through. And we see we are at 81% of the protein actually flows through and it's all compared to when you do just the centrifugation. This is all published in the uh, analytical chemistry uh, last year. Uh, we also further developed this technology for microarray spotting, where we uh, actually implemented a, uh, an assay for detecting antibiotic, the antibiotic enrofloxacin in milk. So today in the dairy, in the, veg, in the milk production, you have a lot of cows together. They give antibiotic to the cow so they don't get sick. But the problem is the antibiotic can come into the milk. And there you have to be careful. You do not want to spread antibiotic in milk. So we want to make a test to make sure that doesn't happen. And here you can see how the synthetic paper is used for spotting, um, for, sp for microarray spots, and how we are able to detect as low as 1.6 nanomolar of this antibiotic, which is better than, or which is on par with the best other tests. Uh, and compared, we also show that this substrate is better than glass and actually nit and nitrocellulose. And you can find this uh, paper was also published last year in Biosense and Bioelectronics. I show this paper here because I want to highlight that the assay for the antibiotics was, uh, was developed by Luisa Villaplana and Pilar Marco, and they work at CSIC in Barcelona. The next part of my talk is about uh, therapy. So I talked first, we talked about sampling, then we talked about detection. Now we're going to talk about therapy. Uh, one project I work in uh, focuses on therapy for inoperable tumor, inoperable tumors. So if you have cancer and you have a tumor, there are typically three treatments. Treatment one is operate tumor away. But sometimes it is not possible. For example, if the tumor is spread out in many different places or if the tumor is in a place that is too hard to reach, for example, in the middle of the brain, it can be too dangerous to operate. Option number two is to give radiation but radiation has a lot of side effects. Option number three is chemotherapy. Chemotherapy means that you give a drug, uh, a toxin, a toxic drug to the patient, and you hope that the drug is more toxic for the tumor than for the healthy body. Yeah? But of course it's toxic for both. So you hope you kill the tumor a little bit more than you kill the body. And of course we see that people with chemotherapy, they are very sick because you give a poison inside the body and your hair starts falling out but it's a little bit more poisonous for the tumor than for the rest of the body. So what we are actually after is we want to target, we want to give this high toxin, but only inside the tumor, nowhere else. So we want to spare the rest of the body. Now to be able to do that, I'm gonna first show a video that explains the technology we're working with. <clears throat> So what we make are core shell microcapsules that contain cells. And so this is a cartoon, how they look like. Here's an actual uh, microscopy, microscopy image of 100 micrometers beads. So you can see they have a soft polymer inside with living cells, and they're surrounded by an osteopolymer uh, shell of typically 10 micrometer thickness. And these cells inside, they are actually, they are um, genetically modified cells 
and they contain, uh, uh, they produce a, a, a cytochrome, which is a biomolecule that converts a prodrug into a toxin. Huh? So what you do is you give the prodrug, it's converted by the cells inside and the toxin comes out of the bead. So the idea is to impl implant a lot of these beads inside the, the vasculature or inside the tumor where they convert the drug. So you give the prodrug iphosphamide, which is rather harmless. It is converted by the bead into cytostatic on the position. Yeah. So what our group did was to figure out how to make this kind of beads, this kind of core shell beads with living cells. The first approach we did was to go to a droplet microfluidic platform where we made little droplets. And in these droplets, we had the cells, of course, and we had a pre-polymer called PEGDA, polyethylene gly glycol di diacylate, and a little bit of photoinitiator. And these droplets we put inside its channels that contained the OSTA material, pre-polymer, and that was an toluene solution. And then we shine UV light. Now, very note very carefully that the photoinitiator only exists inside the droplet. So inside the droplet, the photoinitiator makes the PEGDA to crosslink. So we get a, a, a nice gel here. The cells are in a nice gel, but the photoinitiator also diffuses to the edge of the droplet. And at the edge of the droplet, it starts triggering the grafting of the polymer shell. And so you start growing the polymer, but only on the edge of the droplet. So we have a perfectly uh, uh, co-centered uh, uh, shell around the gel ball. And then, of course, we take them as soon as possible out of the toluene and wash them, and they are ready for use. Here you see images of how that looks like. You can see one bead with uh, a lot of cells that are, the blue ones are alive, the red ones are not so fine. But what you see on the top here is typically what we have when we have a stable running system, microfluidic system, we create beads with typically one or two cells. And that is very beautiful that you can do it but it's not enough because the amount of drug you need is much, much higher. So we want to pack a very high density of cells in there. But this is a problem because if we add a lot of cells in our system, in a microbiotic system, it clogs. The whole microbiotic system, the cells fall down and everything, everything breaks down. You cannot do it. Yeah? So it, that's a problem, how to get a high concentration. Uh, first, I want to show this work was uh, is published, of course, in Advanced Functional Materials. And it was a collaboration with Matthias Lehr, professor at the Karolinska Institute and his team. So now comes in again our, our, uh, uh, our synthetic paper. So I show the synthetic paper. It's like a paper to which you can flow, um, to which you can flow the drug. Actually, <laughs> I have here with me, this is a big scale model of this, uh, oops, of this paper. So you can see how it looks like. It's all these beams. There are, there are sets of beams in all directions, one, two, and you can all see from the top, that's how it looks like. So in this, we show that if you form liquid, it flows through the liquid in this direction, for example, blood. This is very nicely possible. Now I had a very clever student, a Japanese student, uh, Hiroki Yasuga. And he, instead of flowing the, the liquid in the lateral direction, he flowed the liquid from top down. And then very interesting things happen because the liquid does not flow through, it splits up in very small droplets. So in every little cage, he, he found one little droplet. So you get an automatic self-organization of the liquid. Yeah? We call that fluid interfacial energy driven 3D structure emergence in a micropillar scaffold. Yeah? Or in short, fluid dreams. And this is the inspiration for haiku number seven. Wetting the paper, the droplets stand at attention in dreams of fluid. Here you see an image how this looks like in a microscale. So the, these are little droplets of size half a millimeter and they are spaced apart with one millimeter in this specific image. And now what we can do, so we see again how you make this structure. So I already showed this, you, show for four, you shine light from four different directions and you create this kind of scaffold structure. But now what we do is we add first a sample liquid, the blue, and then we add an immiscible liquid such as oil. And as the oil flows through, it will trap little blue droplets of the first liquid here. And this is the result, looks like this. We published this this year in uh, Nature Physics because it's actually the first time we see 
the spontaneous emergence of structure in fluids in a 3D, uh, in a 3D fashion. This is a movie showing, looking now from the top to see what happens. So here we have already filled it with blue liquid and now we're adding a droplet. And please note to see what happens. Now we're adding the oil. The oil presses through the liquid and you will see you get trap only blue, blue droplets in every of these little positions. See? Now we look at the same, but now we look from the side. And we see the same, it's filled with blue, and we see as the, as the oil flows through, how we trap droplets in each of these wells. And this is how this looks like. We get a perfect 3D array of droplets. Now you can do that in many scales. So this was the scale of the millimeter scale. We show this that we can make droplets in, these are scaffolds with, uh, with pitch size of 20 nanometers. So here we have, uh, sorry, 20 micrometer. So here we create little droplets of size only 10 micrometer that are perfectly arrayed. Uh, and this is, the, this is a confocal image of this. You can also do it on a large scale. So this is a five by five centimeter sheet actually. And you do the same and you can, you here you create tens of thousands of droplets at the same time. We show all that this is possible. And of course, why do we need this in this cell encapsulation? This structure does not clog. So I can send cells through here because it's big enough. The cells can flow through. They will not clog. Yeah? And so uh, I can now put a very high density of cell solution, the blue dye with very high density, and then flush through the oil. And I will automatically create this kind of droplets with a high amount. Here you can see all the different cells sitting. I have even more beautiful images here. You can see this is done in alginate, for example. And we have cell densities as high as 100 million cells per milliliter. And this is actually high enough for doing the treatment. Yeah? So with droplet matrix, it didn't work, but with the synthetic paper, now we have high enough density of cells to be able to do this. This is published. This was work with many people, but I would like to specifically highlight. This was done, Hiroki Yasuga came to KTH to do a master thesis. But before that, he was at KU University. He went back to KU University to do a PhD, and right now, he is uh, a researcher at the Okanomizu University. And if you are looking for a very brilliant collaborator in Japan, I would really tell you, please go and talk to this person, very smart person. This was work was also together with a group of Norihisha Miki and Keio and with Shoji Takeuchi from the, uh, who is linked to the Kanagawa Institute uh, of Technology and to the University of Tokyo. Now let's see the last part of my talk. Uh, is about spider silk nanostructuring for tissue engineering. Haiku number eight. From spider silk weave, small spit joints reshaped in fluid grows tissue to life. Um, this work is mainly done by one of my PhD students. Her name is Linnea Gustafsson, and she just finalized her PhD thesis and all the work, work I'm going to talk about. You can actually download and read yourself if you follow this link. This is a link to her PhD thesis. What I'm going to talk about is that you can make spider silk to form nanomembranes, and you can use that to do 2D tissue cultures. You can also use it to make silk nanoparticles and use that in 3D tissue cultures. <laughs> I will start with a movie again. Professor Bouchard, uh, yes. about two, two, three minutes to, 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 to finish the presentation, thank you, if thank possible. You. <laughs> Please take your time anyway. So uh, I have only two minutes, so I will talk fast. Basically, we use E. coli, not from spiders, but from, uh, sorry, 
sorry, we use the silk, not from spiders, but we uh, express it in E. coli bacteria and harvest it. This is done by the group of Muhit Hamar. And then we get a vial of solution of silk protein. And from that solution, we start building our material. And we do that by simply uh, letting the, the silk uh, self-assemble at air. So if you put silk solution, let it stand. At the air interface, the silk will form a film. You can see that you form first little fibers. You can see that here of 20 nanometer size. They together form a film. And here you can see after a couple of hours, you have a film of maybe 200, 300 nanometer thickness. And you can see it consists of very lot of nanofibers. And you, you can see how they grow here. Now, I just want to show you how strong this film is. This is only 200 nanometer thin film, extremely thin. It's 1,000th of a human hair thick film but seven millimeter. And now I just want to show you how strong this is. So we load steel bullets on the top. You cannot see the film at the moment. Soon you will be able to see here on the top. You can see a little bit because it bends down. One. Two. Three. Four, now you can see how the film starts bending. Five. Oh, and here it breaks. But we are able to load 100 milligram on a film that is only 200 nanometer thick. Here you can see another image how that looks like. Here you see inside liquid, and we have a lot of little steel balls, how they bend this nanomembrane but stays intact. You can actually measure the force that you can use. Or you can blow it up as an actuator if you like. This is a beautiful image where you can see actually the silk film, how it looks on the side. I will move forward because I don't have time. We use, uh, uh, you use this to grow cells. This works very nicely. You can see individual cells or we can have a confluent layer. These are skin cells. So these are uh, keratinocytes. Within three days, we have a confluent layer on a large centimeter size scale that you could maybe already use in wound healing. Uh, this is published in uh, Advanced Functional Materials uh, last year. Uh, then we went on and built this to, into the model of the blood, uh, of a blood vessel. And you can see now we do co-culture. We have endothelial cells on one side and muscle cells on the other. This works all very nicely. Interestingly, we can also make this nano wires. And as we talked about, so you roll a droplet. And here you can see how this happens. What hap this is a droplet that is slowly moving. And you can see it leaves the film behind. And as it moves, this film breaks up and forms these tiny nanowires. And this is how they look like in an SEM. They are only 200 nanometer, these wires. They're basically rolled up, but they're only 200 nanometer in diameter. They can be between 5 and 50 micrometer long. So, and here, sometimes you can catch beautiful beads in such wires. We have uh, motorized this. So you can see, for example, we do this now on an, a semi-industrial scale. We make two... 2 million wires within uh, typically uh, 15 minutes. You can see this is droplet rolling over super hydrophobic surface, dragging the wires behind. This is the result of that. Many, many little wires with a very nice diameter. In this case, it was 350 nanometer. Uh, and here I couldn't stop wondering, like your logo of your conference looks very much like my nano wires. And I wonder why this is. So this was published in Advanced Materials uh, in 2018. We then went down, we can measure actually the strength of such a wire and actually you can even break it and you can do chemical uh, measurements. I will go very quickly now. The last images I want to show Yoko are uh, that if, uh, if you can put neural cells on these wires, these are recent results and let them grow. And we get these beautiful images of neurons growing over the wires. So here you have wires underneath and the neurons, the, the neurons will follow the wires and you get these very intricate patterns. We don't know what to use this for yet, but this was observations from a couple of weeks ago when I thought this is a beautiful image I want to show you. These are my sponsors and my last haiku, haiku number nine, is a thank you haiku. A special thank you to Yoko Yamanishi and organizers. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Professor.
about uh, uh, so nice presentations and full of technologies. And uh, haiku uh, is very nice idea to categorize all, all of the haiku numbers, total number is nine haiku, and each haiku has uh, uh, so exciting technologies. I, I really enjoy to listen to your talk. And uh, there's uh, some coincidence uh, 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 between the uh, uh, MEF, uh, MEF uh, the logo and your research. That is also interesting. Anyway, uh, so uh, I uh, receiving uh, lots of questions from the audience, but uh, due to the limitation of the time, I have to choose one question, which is appear on the screen on the site. Uh, uh, the question is re regarding synthetic paper, how do you control the diameter of the hole towards the in plane direction and depth direction? And what about the possibility of large area fabrication? Can, uh, do you? Uh... Yes, uh, let me start with the second question because I have actually images. I went very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, large area fabrication. I show that in an image here, but that went very fast. It is here. Here, it was hidden, but here you can see we make sheets of 10 by 10 centimeters. Mm -hmm. And the second was how to control. Well, here you see the paper. So what you do is you have a mask on the top and mm -hmm. you have holes. So every, every top of a pillar, it was a hole in the mask and the size of the hole, the, the, the size if it's circular or square and the, the pitch and the size will determine. So if I make a, say a, a hole of 20 micrometer, I have a pillar of 20 micrometer. If I mm -hmm. make a hole of 100 micro micrometer, I have a pillar of 100 micrometer. So mm -hmm. I can control that and also the, the, the thickness. And the depth you control by the thickness of the layer. So if I have a very thin layer, I will only have one, one row. But if I have very thick, I can have many, many rows on top of each other. So I can make thick paper by controlling the thickness of the film to start with. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, you, you have the, the material now with you? Uh, no, I do not it's a, there's a big it's the first time i'm in my office in one year due to covid <laughs> <laughs> i have no idea where things are <laughs> uh, there, there is in the lab i'm sorry but i ha don't have it here with me yeah it, it looks but, like uh, paper yeah yeah i can see you and um, um, in the screen and uh, uh okay so uh uh almost the time is up but uh, i'm so enjoyed and uh, so uh, a wonderful presentation i i'd like to thank you uh for to have a time for the keynote presentation thank you very much thank you very much so now the uh, I'm sorry, I would like to add one more question for the, uh, the uh, person who asked the questions. Uh, that will be open on the public after this conference. Uh, the Professor Boucher will answer all each question and then which will be on public. So please come back and then uh, to see the, uh, the questions, yes. answers for each and question. Please, please email me directly if you like. You can find my name very easy on Google. So you sent me questions. I will be very happy to help you. Answer. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Bauder. So I have to move on to the next uh, speaker. That